I would like to say hello to everyone on behalf of the Commission and uh, say a very big thank you to the organizers for inviting us, letting us be part of this very exciting, inspirational event. I'll try not to give a very dull presentation, especially after Mark's very inspiring one, but we thought it will be quite interesting for you to see a bit how we are working together at the European Union, together with member states, with regions, with social partners, to address and to get our systems ready for what we have just seen, the future of work. Uh, I would like to start by saying that indeed we are right now in a very favorable position because we have a very strong political momentum for focusing our energy on improving and modernizing our education training systems to deliver, to help people deal with the challenges of the future. So we have, um, let's say, like for those of you that are familiar with the uh, Charter of Human Rights, we have just had uh, an endorsement by heads of governments of the 2018 member states. We have endorsement by the European Parliament and also our political masters in the European Commission of what we call the pillar of social rights. It's uh, basically a charter stating which should be the rights that each of the individuals living in the EU should have access to. And it's not by coincidence that the first principle, the first right, promotes the right to education and training and lifelong learning. And why I insist a lot on lifelong learning? Because so far we have put all our energy, financial, political, also into initial education training system. But as we have seen with all the challenges that, um, and transformations that our societies are going through, we have to invest and to rebalance much more towards the training that we undertake later in life once we are out of the formal education training systems. So we talk a lot at the EU, together with member states, so not only among ourselves, EU officials, about um, what are the big drivers of change currently for our societies. We talk about automation, digitalization, the power, opportunities that are brought by artificial intelligence. We talk about how traditional employment relations are deeply transforming with the emergence of uh, sharing economy, and not only emergence, but very um, strong exponential growth of this uh, phenomenon. What I would like to insist nevertheless, and I will uh, maybe take us back to some of the Marx uh, remarks indeed, that in uh, Europe especially, robotization is not a new phenomenon because we have countries where actually robots have been used in production processes for quite uh, uh, since 90s already. Germany was mentioned. Uh, of course, uh, there was a high prevalence in the automotive sector. What we are witnessing now, it's really the expansion to other um, uh, industrial sectors. And also we see that the countries where the biggest growth in uh, robot uh, density, so the growth not uh, in terms of what's already there, are countries newcomers, what we will see. For the past um, years, for example, data shows that countries like Romania, Lithuania, Slovakia, Estonia, Portugal are the ones where uh, the penetration of robots in their industry is uh, biggest. In addition to automation, digitalization, we also have uh, in EU quite few other set of challenges, and of course all of them come when they interact together, they bring um, uh, new societal uh, challenges and opportunities. I will uh, start by focusing on um, ourselves as being a very aging society. So already now in the EU we have more people that are over 65 than kids that are under 14 years old. And in just a few years time, by 2030, we will be the oldest region in the world. I know there are many of you coming from uh, Latin America, so maybe just to give you a sense of comparison, in, by 2030, in EU, our median age, median age will be uh, 45, whereas in your case, you will be much younger at uh, around 34. And I will not even mention Africa with 22 years old median age. So you'll see we are really aging. That will put lots of uh, pressure on our 
traditional welfare uh, uh, pension system, especially when you look at the ratio of people of working age against those that will be more towards retirement age. So in the 90s, we had uh, five working age people for every single one going on retirement. Now we are already at four, and this ratio will decrease further from uh, to two to one by um, 2016. At the same time, we have, let's say, the migration challenges and opportunities. And I think there is more and more acknowledgement in the EU that we have to put our act together to encourage legal migration, to allow flows of people, especially that could address uh, our aging uh, workforce. And we have the globalization, and so far, uh, I would say that, uh, of course, you always have a negative and a positive story or a, a way of presenting, talking about globalization. Nevertheless, in the EU, we are uh, truly believers in the fact that we have to engage with globalization. We also see new trends uh, in terms of some companies due to automation, uh, the 3D printing that are just reshoring their uh, businesses, which they relocated years ago to other low cost production countries. Now they are bringing them back to Europe. So we see a, a set of trends that are interacting with each other and we need, we are aware that we have to be ready. We cannot just be simple, um, um, stand buyers, but we have to drive a positive change in uh, this respect. Um, I would also like, again, maybe to get us back to the eternal question, will automation digitalization lead to serious uh, job loss uh, or not? And uh, we know there are very different schools of thoughts from the very much doom scenarios to the more balanced scenarios. Uh, here is just an illustration from the World Economic Forum uh, point of view, uh, which I think uh, reflects quite well, let's say, the balanced approach and the messages that we also heard from Mark that indeed there will be jobs that will be disappearing, but at the same time, there will be many other jobs, many other types of occupations that we may not even know what they are right now that will be emerging. So you have this parallel between uh, job decline in certain jobs, families, and job growth uh, on other side. Then maybe taking us uh, one step farther is to look at um, a more non-conventional way of how uh, jobs will change uh, from now to 2040. And uh, this is based on um, Thomas Frey projections, uh, taking as a model uh, the most common jobs in US right now. So you have on the uh, left-hand side and then taking us really way ahead in the future what could be the most common jobs uh, by 2014. So from all those people that will have to deal, to maintain, um, to give the instructions, to program uh, the robots, then uh, of course lots of people that will engage with analyzing data, then the drones that we had in the very inspiring uh, video before. Someone will need to control, to command, to direct them, to design them, to maintain, fix them when they get broken, and so forth. <clears throat> so what are the key messages that we are taking from this? Um, we need to get our education training systems really up adapted and to have them transformed to keep up with the uh, pace of change that we see in our overall societies. And we have to do that at two levels. We have to do it for the initial education that people get before they are ready to jump on the labor market, no matter how it will look like. But we also need to get people, empower people that themselves are aware and uh, are willing to invest in their continuous upskilling and reskilling to manage all their multiple career transitions um, uh, throughout their working lives. So I would say it's quite interesting when uh, we see this uh, quote, maybe also for us as parents, if we try to figure out what's best for our kids, that actually we are, compared to the past, we are not in a position to really predict what will be their be the best jobs that we would want for them in the future, because we don't know what those jobs will be like. 
So what we are doing at EU to try to prepare the ground in this respect, because we are not having a mathematical formula to decide what are the skills that should be taught now and will enable people to deal with all the changes uh, by um, 2040 or whatever time horizon. So what we are trying to do, we work at multiple level. We work with policymakers from all the 28 member states, but we also work a lot with practitioners on the ground. So we try to bring experts together to talk about this issue, to see how their countries are trying to get ready to uh, reform their systems in order to make them future-proof. We also try to give um, opportunities through funding, especially through Erasmus Plus program, to uh, individual actors to come together to work in uh, uh, international projects and to develop solutions for uh, some of these um, issues. So we, just to give you an illustration, this year we are financing uh, uh, pro vet providers organizations from Erasmus Plus countries to work together to develop joint qualification for future professions. We are also going to um, uh, try to pilot what we call um, networks of centers of vocational excellence. And uh, here maybe I will spend just a few more time because it's uh, a new initiative that we are trying to put together but really based on uh, experience on the ground. And we want to see the centers of excellence. We have quite an ambitious vision for them. They should be like superpowers that they are very well connected into their local communities. They are very well linked to the local business, to uh, universities, to research in their areas. But at the same time, they link very much with similar like-minded centers from other parts of the European Union and also hopefully other parts of the world. We want them to work together that they develop both initial and continuing training qualifications, that they provide business incubators for the vet learners. We are a bit um, tired of seeing that every time we talk about innovation, excellence, there seems to be only one sector that could deliver that, and that is higher education. So we want really to change this approach and to make people aware that innovation comes and is driven also through vocational education training. We also want, um, I think taking also as a good example, uh, centers like Technica here that uh, you visited yesterday, will visit today, uh, that they provide innovation hubs, that they have uh, provide uh, excellent solution to their uh, local SMEs. They uh, have this innovative approach to the learning pedagogics, to how they teach their students. They develop this multidisciplinary project-based approach that brings this different perspective uh, of different professions uh, and trying to come up with uh, new solutions to concrete uh, production uh, or um, uh, business um, problems. Um, last but not least, one um, initiative that uh, we are working and uh, we, I think we have a very huge challenge ahead of us is uh, really to try to bring everyone uh, to a certain level of skills that will enable them to safely navigate through this future of learning and future of work. And uh, I will uh, say that uh, maybe from the outside it may look like uh, Europe is a very a highly educated society and it is true because we have quite good enrollment rates in higher education, quite good educational achievement at upper secondary. Nevertheless, uh, you should be aware that we have about 70 million Europeans, people living in the EU, mostly natives, that have problems with basic reading and writing basic mathematical uh, formulas and they don't have any digital skill at all. And if these people are left behind in this process of fundamental transformation of our societies, this will come with a high price on our potential for competitiveness, growth and innovation, but also very high societal price. So we believe that we have really to invest lots of efforts in bringing these people one step further on their skill ladder in order to enable them to um, survive and to strive on the future labor markets. 
And last but not least, uh, we are working to change image about vocational education training. I know here we are in a community of people that we believe in uh, the value of vocational education training, and I hope that we believe that it's a good thing also for our kids and not only for someone else's kids. But this is not uh, the case uh, all over the Europe. In most of the countries, vocational education training is really the pathway that people take because they have been perceived as not being good enough to pursue academic studies. And we want to change this image. We want to really show that you can have wonderful career opportunities, wonderful learning opportunities, by engaging into vocational education training, and that's what we do through the Vocational Skills Week, a sort of campaign that is targeted to learners, to parents, uh, to companies, because it's also you need companies that they should be also deeply convinced that for them getting someone to train while they are still in their initial education is not a cost, but it's an investment in their future um, employees, in a future improved um, skills uh, supply on the labor market. So we are discussing and preparing together with member states, social partners, but also VET providers, what we call a policy vision for what the VET system should be, should look like in the future. And uh, we hope that uh, this, uh, there will be what we call a tripartite agreement, meaning uh, um, government representatives, trade unions, employers from 28 member states coming together and agreeing that this is what we should work to, uh, these are the objectives towards which we should all work together at European level. You see here kind of the key ideas that are emerging from the process of uh, preparing this uh, tripartite agreement. And um, may, I will not go through all of them, but I will insist maybe on a few elements. First, um, we always had the question about um, how can we prepare our kids for future labor markets when we don't know what jobs they will be into? And um, there is more and more, um, let's say, a strong consensus in our VET community that actually we don't need to define now in 2018 all the skills that they will need. What we need to do, we need to make sure that the VET the VET systems are designed in such a way that they are flexible and agile enough to respond continuously, to adapt continuously to skills demands. And um, there is also an agreement that there needs to be a certain rebalancing of the general transversal skills, problem solving, learning to learn, curiosity, uh, these are the skills that we need to impair much more through vocational education training than we used to do so far. So there needs to be a rebalancing of uh, those lifelong learning skills at the expense of the technical because the technical will keep on changing at, uh, with a dramatic pace and they could also be learned um, uh, throughout our working lives. So we see this uh, emergence of the concept of hybrid hybrid hybridization, so bringing more academic into vocational education training, while at the same time we see also that higher education is moving to getting more practical vocational elements in uh, their provision. Uh, we also see more and more that if we want to have a performing vocational education training system, they have to open their eyes to the world. We cannot look only at what's happening in a country, in a region. We have to cooperate, we have to learn from each other. There has to be this mutual trust in each other's vocational education training system. And this is what we try to do is the internationalization, allowing for this cross-country uh, cooperation at all different levels of intervention. Then there is also lots of talk around the issue of efficiencies and synergies. We see more and more countries that are um, reducing dramatically the number of their qualifications, developing what we call broad-based qualifications, so giving a broader skills of set that allow people then later on to adapt uh, to various uh, new uh, job trends. And also the integration of initial and continuing vocational education training. So maybe to illustrate a bit um, this element, 
It's not that uh, we come to the Basque country to preach the values of the Finnish VET system, but uh, I wanted just to give you an illustration of how many different approaches you can have in terms of uh, trying to address the very same challenges that we talk. And Finland is really right now in the process of uh, putting into place one of the most um, innovative um, uh, reforms that we have seen of their VET system, which basically is moving towards a very much learner-centered uh, approach. So the whole um, traditional concept that you have a standard set of programs and people have to choose among those, whatever fits them best, this is, uh, will be wiped out. And uh, um, there will be lots of new flexibility in, embedded in the new system. Learners in initial VET, they could start no matter at which point in time in the academic year, and always the starting point will be what they call the kind of skills assessment, trying to see what set of skills, knowledge the person already has, and what is the person aiming to achieve, and then developing an individualized learning plan that will be composed of let's say modules like pieces of the uh, puzzle that will come together to reach a full qualification. They are also moving ahead with diversifying a lot the learning environment, so really going beyond what we traditionally know for VET, that we have the school-based and the work-based, but trying to embed new technology, simulators, augmented reality, and so forth. Then, um, as I mentioned before, there is um, yeah, this uh, principle of giving them a broader set of skills, but very strong, fundamental, let's say, life starting a kit uh, to start your life, your working life, and then uh, that will enable them at all stages of their life to continue adapting to uh, further skills demands. And another quite important element of uh, the VET system, of course, it's the high investment that they put into their teachers and trainers that are fundamental in delivering this uh, vision. So what do we do also, because we do work a lot and we have lots of political statements in terms of uh, what uh, should we aim to, uh, what VET system should look like, but of course uh, the question always is, but how do you translate this uh, talk into concrete action? So, we are very happy, actually, to see that uh, this commission um, is uh, really very eager to put the funding where the policy priority are, so that to secure this perfect match between the policy talk and the concrete actions. And uh, we have just announced, uh, let's say, our proposal that, of course, will have to be negotiated with, with member states, with parliament, of um, how much money should go to what policy investment areas uh, for uh, the period 2021 to 2027. And you'll see here that actually there is a very, very strong focus on innovation and uh, digital, which will have a significant um, amount of funding for the next um, uh, programming period. At the same time, uh, we also strongly believe that uh, these investments in excellence, growth, competitiveness should not come at the expense of social, of people. So there is a, a second uh, budgetary heading uh, that looks at uh, investing in um, cohesion of regions, cohesion, uh, social cohesion, um, and investing in people. And this is where most of the investment uh, for vocational education and training will go through. Then, of course, we also care about the environment, about our natural resources. So there is another um, uh, budgetary allocation for this. And quite important for us, uh, especially in our relation with the outside world, is the funding that we put in maintaining and deepening those relations. So with about 123 billion planned for the next um, seven years. So if I have to zoom in a bit more, uh, for those of you, I'm sorry, coming, it's more relevant for those coming from Europe, but uh, just to highlight that indeed there will be 100 billion that will go to a renewed European social fund that will bring together 
few other funds, so it will be joined up with the EASY, the Employment and Social Innovation Program, Health Program, but also with the Youth Employment Initiative. And there is only good news under Erasmus program because with its double budget of 30 billion, this also translates into lots of new possibilities for supporting vocational education and training. So we are really aiming to triple the number of learners that will engage in uh, VET. We are also aiming to support mobility, not only for those that are in initial VET, but also those that are in continuing education training. And last but not least, quite important, to give opportunities, same as for higher education, for VET learners to have a mobility experience outside EU with other parts of the world. So if I am to conclude here, I will just um, like to end with a quote from Da Vinci, who in a way has been the icon or the image of uh, our cooperation in EU on vocational education and training. And I think the key message that we have to take from here is that indeed, with all the new technology, we have access to lots of knowledge. And what's important is not only that we have this access, is that we actually do use, we do process that knowledge in order to do and achieve concrete things. So we must do and we must do it together. Thank you very much.